Hi, Church. It's Kaylee and Kyla. Bessie Coleman was the first African American woman to hold a pilot's license and was the first black person to earn an international pilot's license. Bessie Coleman developed an early interest in flying, but African American women had no training opportunities in the United States, so she decided to save up and go to flight school in France. Bessie Coleman stated, I decided black should not have to go through the difficulties I have faced, so I decided to open a flying school and teach other black women how to fly. Coleman inspired generations of African American aviators, including the Tuskegee Airmen and NASA astronaut Dr. Mae Jeminson. She carried Bessie Coleman's picture aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor in September 1992 when she became the first African American woman in space. She's cool. Well, good morning, and thank you again for tuning in to our broadcast this morning. Thank you so much, Team Wilson, for sharing with us that Black History fact. And again, as we celebrate Black History Month, uh, we just want to pause and just even just look back and seeing how I mean, God has used uh, African Americans to really impact our nation. Well, today we are continuing on in our quarantine series where we're picking up and continuing on in Matthew chapter number four, picking up where I left off on last week at verse number uh, verse number five. So really, really excited today to hear from our community groups pastor, one of our elders here, David Harris. He's going to share God's word with us this morning. So I know you're going to be greatly encouraged. Hey, go ahead right now on uh, this feed and share this with someone, you know, who's going through some hardship. Someone you know who is experiencing a wilderness season right here. Why don't you go ahead and share this feed and tag them? Because we believe, man, God has a word for them this morning. So go ahead and take a few moments to do that. And let me pray over our time together. And then we're going to hear from our worship team. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your people. And God, we thank you for your presence. Now, oh God, would you give us ears to hear? Make our hearts ready to worship you, our great and mighty God. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the incorruptible seed of your word. We love you, and God, we're expecting you to speak to us in a mighty way today. Minister to that man, woman, boy, or girl, who right now they're in a season of wilderness and quarantine. Would you meet them in a special way this morning? It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. Well, again, thanks so much for tuning in. And now I'm going to turn over to the capable hands of our worship team. God bless. All right, this song is a familiar one to his church. So we just hope that you sing out and declare about our God that can turn death into life, graze into gardens. I search the world, sing with us. Oh, I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Oh, man's empty praise, treasures that fade. Never enough, and you came along, yeah. put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh, oh there's Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all. You still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. Amen. And there's not a place for your mercy and grace won't find me. you, there's nothing better than you, 
there's nothing, nothing is better than you, no, sing to him this morning, oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing, nothing Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can sing those words again. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. through periods of isolation and quarantine, um, but also just knowing and resting in the fact that God, He never leaves us, He never fails us, He's walking right beside us. I remember when I was a child, my mom used to have this poem um, hanging in our home, it was called Footprints, and it was all about how, um, you know, there was one point where you see two footprints in the sand, and it's Jesus walking right alongside that person, and then there's another point where you only see one set of footprints, and it's because Jesus was carrying the the author, um, the writer, through whatever it is they were going through, and how um, fitting is that for what we're talking about today and in this series about God just carrying us through, even through those moments where um, we aren't sure if He's near or we're not sure if we're going to make it through. Um, so I pray that this next song, Yes I Will, just reminds you of that truth and that this um, time that we spend together just reminds you of the fact that He is always near, He is always with us, He's always working it out for us. Let's sing together, church. I count on one thing, 
The same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Your name.
Well, good morning, Midtown Bridge. I hope you're doing well on this Valentine's Day Sunday. Um, my name is David uh, Harris, and I have the privilege to serve as the community group's pastor here at the bridge. And I'm so thankful for the opportunity to come and share God's word with you this morning. We are continuing today in our series called Quarantine that Milton started last week, where we're really focusing on the idea that isolation with God is a prescription not a punishment. So in this time where uh, as we have had this forced separation from those that we love, we have spent so much time apart, um, we've, we've come to look at the idea of quarantine, the idea of separation in this very negative way. And so I'm looking in this series to, to help redeem that idea um, of isolation uh, and alone time with God. So uh, as a community groups pastor, I love the idea of us being together uh, as a church body, but also recognize that there is great value in that time that we spend alone uh, with God. And so we will be continuing uh, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verses 5 through 7. And I want to just talk a little bit about um, the idea of these trials in the, in the wilderness. Last week, Milton was focusing on provision, uh, but this week I'm going to be focusing on pride and protection. 
So the title for this week's uh, sermon is Pride and Protection, and we'll be focused on verses 5 through 7 of Matthew chapter 4. So let me read that passage for us. <clears throat> then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, for this time that we can be together as a church family. We are grateful for your word, the example that you have laid out for us, um, but even more importantly, the, the story that you have detailed of your son Jesus, of his time walking on this earth, and the incredible sacrifice and incredible suffering that he went through to deliver us uh, from the wages of our sin, which is death to restore us into a right standing with you. So we are thankful for that this morning. And I pray that as we look through this passage, as we study your word together, that we will, uh, that we will arrive at a place of gratitude and look for opportunities to spend time alone with you so that we may be refreshed, that we may be rejuvenated, that we may become just a little bit more like your son, with every breath, with every day that goes by. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I wanted to bring this uh, message to you from uh, a cool remote location and really drive home this idea of isolation and separation. I went with my family uh, up to a cabin in North Georgia over the weekend and um, we got away and it was gorgeous views and had everything planned out and then uh, the weather uh, just turned against us and didn't get a really nice day to do that. But um, but I got a great trade-off. I, I came home with uh, what appears to be some kind of uh, stomach virus. And as you can hear, it's affecting my voice as well. And so um, I'm isolated in a different way, the way we've all come to, to, to be accustomed over the past uh, almost year now. <clears throat> and so while I'm not driving home the, the same imagery that Milton did last week, um, I'm doing my part. So as we, as we dig in and we, and we start to look a little bit uh, at this passage, um, I want to talk a little bit first about um, the, the temptation itself. So I want us to focus there and then I'll, I'll end our time really driving home some ideas for practical application, what we can take through. But I want to clarify and I want to be upfront that these passages, as we read about the temptation of Jesus, um, they're written from a historical perspective, and they are talking about specific events that Jesus underwent as part of his earthly ministry. And so it's not um, what I'm providing uh, and what we are providing through this series um, is not something that's explicitly stated in this passage. So I want us to recognize um, and just want to be transparent with you as a, as a church body that we're not trying to read something into this passage that isn't there. This passage is explicitly talking about Jesus' trials in the wilderness at the hands of Satan. But what we can do as a form of discipleship, which in its, in its basis definition is us becoming more like Christ, is what examples can we take from the life of Christ? What examples can we take from how he addressed um, and countered uh, these temptations from Satan uh, and what can we do in those ways to to make ourselves more like him? So please understand as I say that I'm not asking us or saying that when we um, when we look to uh, go into isolation with God, when we look to spend time alone with God, that we should be anticipating a period of temptation. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, I want us to be faithful to the text as well, but move into those practical applications for our daily walk uh, as well. So the first point that I want us to look at and see what is happening here within this passage is the idea that Satan hopes to play on Jesus's divine position rather than his divine character and plan. So I'll say that again. Satan hopes to play on Jesus's divine position rather than his divine character and plan. When you think back, I'm going to age myself a little bit here, but I think about um, some of the, the people that that I came across um, on television and in the early early days of social media, but seeing 
these um, individuals that started becoming famous or becoming prevalent um, with seemingly no uh, rationale behind it. So what, what I remember was, was Paris Hilton and Nicole Ritchie um, starting to be um, in newspapers and magazines constantly, and then they had television shows. And then we had, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Kardashians coming behind them. And, and now it seems we have just this army of social media influencers whose only job, as far as I can tell, is to be famous, to be known. And so when I think about those individuals and how they are, they are striving, what their, what their goal is, is simply to rely on the adulation, to rely on the fame that their name might bring them. And this is actually what Satan is attempting to do with Jesus to some extent uh, with this passage. Um, we see there is a little bit of a, a um, two sides of the same coin with the first two uh, trials or tests that um, that Satan gives to Jesus. So last week, Milton talked about um, the temptation of provision. So saying, Jesus, if, if you're hungry, can you save yourself? And then in this, we see the flip side of that coin, which is really a fancy way of saying, hey, let your, let, let your dad bail you out, right? If you are going to um, truly say that you are the son of God, why don't you why don't you put a little bit of that, that a little bit of that umph that God brings, that that all powerful God? Let's just ask Him to save you by placing you on top of the temple and having you cast yourself down. So what a challenge is being placed before before Jesus here. If he had if he had succumbed to this temptation, he would essentially be admitting or acknowledging that in some way he was not equal uh, with God the Father that he was relying on uh, the help uh, or the assistance of God to deliver him from this situation. So rely in this case, again, thinking in that, in those uh, worldly examples that I gave before, I'm, I'm relying on a name. I'm relying on some sort of fame uh, or unearned credibility to deliver me from a situation. And so perhaps as we think about this, the amazing thing that Satan in all of his scheming and in all of his planning, could not have recognized or not have foreseen or understood that part of the broader divine plan for Jesus was that he would not be delivered, that his father would not deliver him from the hands um, of his accusers, that he would uh, ultimately suffer on earth for us, that he would suffer greatly at the hands of the Romans, and that he would be crucified on a cross. That this way of paying that price for us is not something that could be bypassed. It's not something that could be done short of, um, short of Jesus committing this act on our behalf, being saved from being thrown down. This idea that Jesus as divine royalty, as, um, as this galactic being that was, that was somehow unable to be touched or to be harmed, I guess Satan had not considered the idea that harm was the only way through which Jesus might ultimately redeem his people on earth. An incredible point to think about. And even more so, a, a something to drive home this point is the idea that Jesus, one of his primary ways of connecting with mankind is through his suffering. So when we think about Jesus and we try to grasp the concept that he is both fully God and fully man at the same time. The only way that we can truly relate to him as someone who could overcome temptation the way we are unable to do so frequently we fall into temptation. Where can we connect with Jesus and his, his manhood? Where can we connect with that? It's through the fact that he suffered. He suffered more than us. He suffered emotionally. He suffered physically in unspeakable ways. So we can relate to our Savior because he suffered just as we have suffered. So when we see Satan throw a passage toward Jesus saying, you will not strike your foot against a stone. It's written in scripture that the angels will swoop in and save you. Jesus would be struck by much more than a stone, and he would do that for us, and he would do that willingly for us. What an incredible, what an incredible testimony that we have in the life of Jesus that's being challenged. 
just in this first in this first piece of this passage. But you have to recognize again, this is Satan's attempt. This is his second attempt so far to try to get Jesus um, to essentially abandon his plan, to try a different route, and to try to to play on these things that, in Satan's mind, I guess he believed would um, would be a chance to derail Jesus uh, from his deliverance of mankind. So the second point that I'd like us to, to call out is, is related to that passage and that quote from Satan. So the second point is Satan does use scripture to confuse. So that's the second, the, the second thing that I want us to focus on here. Satan uses scripture to confuse. It's an attempt to confuse the situation. And I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what we see Satan using here in the passage that Satan is using because he's pulling from Psalm 91. And so Psalm 91, if I go back and read it, <coughs> he's actually referring to a couple of, a couple of verses here, uh, but essentially the quotes are around verses 11 and 12, but I'm going to read verses 9 through 12 for you right now. He says, if you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So this passage is really about the refuge and the safety of God. It's a, it's a great passage. It's, it's extremely timely. And if you, if you know nothing of the character of Jesus, if you're reading for the first time and you believe that all scripture is God breathes, you, could, you might feel that Satan is kind of scoring a point here. It's the only time of the three temptations where he uses the word uh, against Jesus or to try to trap or, um, or to mislead in some way. But there's something important that I want us to note about Psalm 91 that's really interesting, and I think it's, it's perfect, um, both in terms of how Satan misinterprets, um, but also for how Jesus ultimately kicks back against this temptation. And that is that Psalm 91 is not specifically messianic. What I mean by that, for, I know it's kind of a church term, but what that means is that that is not one of the passages in the Old Testament that specifically talks about the coming of the Messiah, the, the one who would deliver Israel, uh, ultimately deliver mankind from their sins. So we see lots of passages that are, that are mentioned frequently that are messianic in nature. They are talking about that coming individual. But this isn't one of those. Psalm 91 is basically addressed to, to all believers. It's a word of encouragement for us. We can trust those words. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone is meant to be encouraging for the entire body of believers, all children of God. And so while Jesus obviously is the son of God, so he would fall into that category, it's not specific to Jesus. It's not, it's not specific to the Messiah. And so if, if, if Jesus had accepted this, what Satan is doing, and again, kind of a, a very sneaky way, is that he would be more, Jesus would be more man than God in a way, if he were to accept this or succumb to this temptation, because he would be, he would be stepping into uh, a verse that is meant for all of us, that is not specifically regarding uh, uh, the divine presence uh, of the Messiah. And so I think that's, that's an interesting piece to, to recognize. And it's also uh, a, an important side note, I guess, would be that it's, it's not a call for us to engage in intentionally dangerous or unsafe activity. There's nothing in Psalm 91 that says that we should cast ourselves from the top of a high building, uh, as Satan is advocating here for Jesus to do. And so um, it's fascinating to see that scripture is being used and that Satan is doing so. And that's certainly um, useful for us to keep in mind as one small practical takeaway, to keep in mind that there will be people, there will be individuals in your lives, and, and you may have even done this um, at times yourself, is wrenching scripture out of context to try to justify your activity, um, to try to dismiss something as important or unimportant, um, that you maybe are feeling convictions, uh, but haven't had the, um, just the presence or the, the ability to give that over to God and step away from whatever that behavior is. 
those types of things come from a misunderstanding, a fundamental misunderstanding of what Scripture is saying, but also from a lack of trusting God and trusting his word and trusting the character of the one behind that word to be faithful in those things that have been laid out in Scripture. So it's very important for us to remember. And as we move into the third point that I want us to to take from this passage, it's simply this, that Jesus responds with, the definition of faith. Jesus responds with the definition of faith. So let's read it again. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what is Jesus saying here? It's such a, it's such a brief answer and we see that um, that's the end of this particular temptation. It, it ends the debate, it ends the discussion uh, with just this one quote. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. This quote is from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. And um, this is around the the narrative uh, of the Ten Commandments where where God is rebuking and correcting uh, the children of Israel. And he is saying, follow me with real trust. Don't test as you wander in the wilderness. And the history of Israel, the history of all of mankind is this... um, continual notion of testing God rather than trusting God. So as we, as we think through the very simple response that Jesus gives, he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. We're hit with this kind of earth shattering reality in our lives, but think about how, how Satan would take this as well. Because while we are seeing this this call back to putting complete trust in God, there's another reference to this particular phrasing uh, that exists in Isaiah uh, chapter 7 and verse 12. And it's when Ahaz is claiming, as he's speaking with Isaiah, that he will not put the Lord his God to the test. And so you see the same phrasing. And again, as uh, as Milton talked last week, um, the readers uh, of Matthew um, as devout and practicing Jews would recognize this phrasing not only from Deuteronomy, but from Isaiah and the fact that so many young people and students um, within the, the nation of Israel would recognize and have studied and memorized large portions uh, of the Old Testament uh, of, their, of their scripture and their prophecies would recognize that following that comment from Ahaz in Isaiah 7.12 comes Isaiah 7.14. And what were we talking about before? Messianic texts. In Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord shall give you a son. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. Now, why is this significant? Why is this important to this passage? To me, it's incredible because with one sentence, Jesus essentially references not one passage, but two. And he makes two statements in doing so. First, He calls upon you to trust completely the God he serves. So don't put the Lord your God to the test. Just like the the ancient Israelites, I'm going to completely trust God. But second, I'm also reinforcing my identity because this, as opposed to your very vague scripture, Satan, uh, here's a very specific one where we're going to talk about The Lord shall give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call him Emmanuel. Jesus is stamping the claim that he is the Messiah right into this passage. While he doesn't come out and say it, by using this specific quote, he would call to mind for the reader exactly this passage to say, oh, here we have this text that's been used hundreds of times, thousands of times as we think through at Christmas time. This passage gets used frequently to talk about, oh, the Lord's going to give us a sign that a, that a virgin shall deliver a child, and that child would be Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is putting Satan's temptation to bed on, on again, multiple fronts. I'm going to continue to trust my God, but I also want you to know that this isn't just some guy that you're dealing with. You are dealing with God made flesh dwelling among people. I am the Messiah. 
What an incredible, incredible response in just those few short words that Jesus gives to Satan. So Satan is general. Jesus gets specific. And so as we think about this passage, just what, what an incredible, uh, just, it's only a few verses, but it, but it reminds us so much of the character of Jesus. It reminds us of his behavior toward, um, toward us, his love toward us, uh, in, in these responses, in his calm and measured responses uh, to the evil one, trying everything in his power to derail the beautiful plan that God had for us through his son. And so as we think about how we can bring ourselves uh, into a place of obedience and of following and looking to become more like Jesus, we don't necessarily have to go alone into the wilderness. We don't have to uh, succumb to a, an excruciatingly specific um, effort on the part of Satan to tempt us and lead us astray. We have enough of those trials in our day to day. We don't need all of those things, but what can we take and what can we glean from these behaviors from Jesus that can allow us to look just a little bit more like him? I think there's three things that I want to leave you with. The first one is humility. Again, Jesus casts off in his response any notion of, hey, just because of who my father is, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll just cast myself off of, this, um, off of this building and be saved and just rely on my, my fame or my power to do so. No, um, Jesus sets the example for us of, of being humble. Ultimately, he would set the example for us through his suffering as well and through his service to his disciples, to those around him. Those are the examples that we can take from Jesus in this passage. And so thinking both as a believer, um, the, the humility to say that I'm not bulletproof. I'm not going to, to go out and live my life in a way that, that shows a disregard for those things around me. I'm not going to be unsafe um, or reckless with my life or with the lives of those around me because my life has value because um, Christ has purchased that, that life for us, that eternal life for us. And so we aren't bulletproof as Christians. We don't have to, to live in a crazy way, and we're not called to do that, and that's the temptation that Satan has placed in this passage. But also, it's just a great application for daily living, for us to be humble in our interactions with those around us, to live in a place of humility. How are we modeling uh, to other people that we encounter that we don't consider ourselves better than them. We don't consider ourselves to ha have arrived at some place of superiority, whether it's, whether it's financial or whether it's spiritual or whether it's mental and emotional health. And none of those things are we trying to lord over our place of position or authority over those uh, around us, but to live a life of humility. So asking God as we take this time alone with him in these moments that we seek alone time with God, to ask um, God to help us to trust him. And in doing so, in trusting God and being intentional about that, we'll start to see that humility play out in our lives. This isn't about us. This is about God, Christ, working through us to love those around us and to make us more, more humble. The second thing I believe is important for us to take from this is, is biblical accuracy, sufficiency, and study. We're never going to know the word as well as Jesus did, but that doesn't mean we can't try. I would challenge us to be more intentional in our alone time with God, to know how are we, how are we ever going to be able to, to rebuke and resist the snares and temptations of the devil if we don't rely on the word of God already laid out before us. The answers are there. The refuge is there. We simply need to rely on it, to seek it out. And don't try to do all of these things on our own. I think too often we get alone with the Bible and we try to, to figure all of these complex uh, concepts and difficult passages to read or translate or understand. We try to do those things on our own. Theologians have stood on the backs of the church fathers for hundreds of years. Let's rely on those. Nothing equates with Scripture. Nothing will ever be on a par with Scripture, but we can bring other resources into our alone time with God. Bring a study, bring a commentary, bring a book with you to help you to unearth those truths that are there just waiting to be uncovered and discover the richness and the fullness of the Word of God. 
And in those ways, we know that we can take that out and practically apply it uh, to our lives and to our interactions with those uh, that we encounter every day. And the last thing to take from this, uh, the trait that we should be uh, striving for as we read through this passage is to believe God for his promises. The Israelites didn't. Uh, we often don't when it comes to, uh, to our work, when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to um, our families. We often don't trust God for the promises that he has laid out in scripture. We often are those who put God to the test. We, we challenge God to come through and we say that if you are real, if you are capable, if your character is what you say it is, then meet this need for me. Come through in this way for me. We don't need to do that. We betray our devotion to God and we betray our full, the fullness of our faith to him when we pick and choose the things that we will trust him for. The yoke is easy and the burden is light, but that doesn't mean that he requires anything less than our complete and utter devotion to him. So as we think about how we accept, we think about what our faith walk looks like, let's trust God for his promises and let's use that time that we are alone with him uh, to get into his word, to trust and read in um, embracing the promises that he has already told us. We don't need to find new information. We'll get that through our study. We'll learn new things. We'll, we'll have our eyes opened to the truths of God constantly. But there are promises that he has laid out explicitly and expressly for us in his word. Let's trust him for those. Let's trust the character of our good God. Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 1 through 4 says, it says, a wicked generation asks for a sign, uh, but none will be given it. We show our lack of faith when we put our God to the test. Satan betrayed um, his woefully inadequate uh, concept of who Christ was and the character and nature of God. Somehow, despite um, being of, of, uh, a being of his status to have once occupied uh, heaven, to be cast out and to no longer see or recognize that nature of God. Let's not be an individual that puts God to the test. Let's trust God for his promises. Church, I love you. I'm so thankful again for the opportunity to have shared with you. Thank you for bearing with my, uh, my voice, my scratchiness, um, and I'll pray now uh, for us that we will uh, continue uh, to try to model Christ uh, in our day-to-day, -day, and then I'll turn it back over to our worship team. Father God, we come before you again grateful, thankful, and in awe of your plan for this world. That you looked at our shortcomings, you looked at our sin all, all down through history, not just looking at the sins that had been committed at the time that you sent your son, but looking at all the sins that would be committed throughout history after Jesus' birth and death and resurrection. You knew the things that we would do. You knew how we would fall short, and yet you sent him anyway. And Jesus, being the same as you in character, willingly took that cup of wrath and went to the cross for us. So we thank you. We cannot express our gratitude strongly enough, but we can dedicate and commit our lives to living as much like Christ as we can. So Father God, may we not object, may we not challenge your authority, may we not challenge and resist your promises, but may we be um, humbly submissive to your promises and to your word and its guidance in our lives. And when it guides us into difficult and challenging places, that we would trust you just as fully then as we would as we were, when we were walking on the mountaintops and when we were um, seeing rich blessings in our lives and every indication that we were walking with you, um, but that we would praise you just as much and thank you just as much in those dark seasons of, of isolation, of sickness, of defeat, of despair, of poverty. 
of abandonment. God, we love you. We praise you. We give all the glory to you. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Church, have a great week.
Well, thank you so much, worship team, and thank you, David, for that word. Uh, again, I pray and trust that you were greatly encouraged by God's word this morning. Hey, if you if maybe today the gospel made sense for you to use it for the first time, I want to encourage you to email us at info at the Midtown Bridge. We'd love to schedule a time to meet with you to hear how you sense Jesus is working in your life. Midtown Bridge family, thank you so much for being such a generous church. Thank you for the ways in which you're investing uh, God's resources into this ministry so that we can be a blessing to others, literally all around this city, all around the country, and actually all around the world. Every time you give, you make it possible for us to be a blessing to someone somewhere that they might actually hear the gospel and even have precious needs being met. So thank you for being such a generous church. Hey, a couple of things we have happening here at the Midtown Bridge. I want to invite you to join us on Wednesday mornings at 6.30 a.m. And, and Saturday mornings at 8 o'clock a.m. for a time of prayer. We, we believe prayer is one of the great opportunities we have as believers to seek the heart of God for what he wants to do in our lives, but also to pre prepare us to be used by him in, our, in the lives of others. So please join us on Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m. and Saturdays at 8 o'clock a.m. for a time of prayer. And we're, gonna, we're doing those calls by way of Zoom. You can visit our website to kind of find that Zoom link and join us there. I also want to invite you all to join us by way of community. This week, our community groups are meeting uh, based upon geographic locations. So based upon where you live in the city, it's a great opportunity to connect with other believers in your neck of the city, whether you're in Perimeter North, you live in the Perimeter North of the Perimeter, or if you live in Midtown area, or if you live south of the city, we'll have community groups meeting online for you to connect with. So again, go to our website, click on the community group page, and you can click on that Zoom link. It'll take you right into those meetings on Wednesday or Thursday this week. Last but not least, uh, Pillar students, those who are middle school and high school, want to invite you to join us today at 12 o'clock online for our Pillar Youth Meeting. It's a great time to connect as you guys get a chance to nurture your faith uh, with other peers uh, around the city. Thanks so much for tuning in again to this broadcast. And let me pray benediction over our week as we get ready to head into a new week. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you for what our ears have heard and our hearts have received. And, God, I pray that we will hold on to that word. And, God, it will bring about transformation in our life, but also in the lives of others. Lord, we love you and we're so grateful that we had a chance to hear your word, to receive your word, to be changed by your word. So, Spirit of the living God, would you move us into obedience and action this week? We love you and we praise you and we trust you. It's in the mighty name of Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks again for tuning in. And remember to share this broadcast with someone you know who's going through a wilderness experience this week. God bless you. And hopefully we'll see you all on next week. Lord willing.